Hello everyone, this is the CircuitPython Weekly for October 28th, 2024. It's the time of week where we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Jeff and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython, which is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support Adafruit and CircuitPython and folks like me and Tim and Dan and Anne, uh, please consider purchasing your hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join any time by going to adafru.it slash discord. We hold the meeting in the CircuitPython Dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel. This meeting, as it uh, typically happens, is on Mondays at 2 p.m. U.S. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. We do move that when it coincides with a U.S. holiday. In our notes document, there is a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings to our CircuitPythonistas on Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications or to talk in the meeting, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. There is a notes document that accompanies this meeting and recording. After the fact, you'll find it down in the show notes as a link. You can use it to skip around to the parts of the video that interest you the most. If you're participating in the meeting, check the pinned messages to find the latest notes document so you can add your notes for the upcoming meeting or follow along as we go through the meeting live. And if you uh, wish to participate but can't attend or don't wish to uh, speak, you can leave your hug reports and status updates and we will read them out during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. Next up is community news where we take a little look at the uh, Python on Microcontrollers newsletter. After that, we follow with the state of CircuitPython, the libraries, and Blinka, where we go over some, st some stats that talk about the health of the project. Then we have a couple of round robin sections, hug reports and status updates. In the case of hug reports, we take the time to highlight good things that folks are doing in the community around us. And in status updates, you get a chance to toot your own horn or say where you're having trouble by telling us what you've worked on since the last time you joined us and what you hope to get up to over the next week or so. And finally, if necessary, we'll have a part of the meeting called In the Weeds. If there is a need for more long-term discussion, this is the place to do it. This can be uh, something that we identified ahead of time or something that in status updates becomes clear is more of a discussion than a, a quick update. And uh, so add those to the document if you have any topics to discuss. And that covers how the meeting will go. And now I will tab over here and talk to you about community news. Uh, I've picked a few items from the um, newsletter. Let's see. Hold on. <laughs> I've forgotten how to do this. Um, so these are a few items from the CircuitPython newsletter, and I'll tell you more about what that is in a minute. But first up, we passed one of those numeric milestones. CircuitPython now has 503 libraries. This counts the CircuitPython library bundle and the CircuitPython community library bundle. These are libraries are separate files designed to work with CircuitPython code. And there's a link to a uh, article there on the Adafruit blog. Next up, I've got a couple of badge items. Uh, the SuperCon 8 badge holds six add-ons and runs MicroPython. And as you can see from the picture there, that is coming right up. Supercon is November 1st through 3rd in Pasadena, California. I won't be going, but I am pretty sure there will be super cool people there. And with the conference badge, you will have a device running CircuitPython. So uh, that is cool. And the SAO is called the Simple Add-On, a, a standard created in 2017 by Hackaday. This badge can attach six different SAOs and runs MicroPython to communicate among them. There's a also, uh, yeah, that's Hackaday link. Thanks for putting those in the channel. And then I saw this one on my socials and passed it along to Anne. This is one of those SAO add-ons and it is a record scratch, a small board with a circular capacitive touch sensor for digital scratching of vinyl records. So check out that Mastodon thread or more technical details on hackaday.io. Moving away from the badge theme, the final item I picked is a Raspberry Pi Zero DIY music player. And I gathered that this was published in the Magpie, but that you'll find some details on Imager. All right. So these news items and more are available in the weekly Python for Microcontrollers newsletter, which goes out by email on Monday mornings. 
Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Thank you, Anne, for putting the newsletter together. But this is a community effort. If you have any Python on hardware projects to share, your own or someone else's, or find content you'd like to see included, please consider contributing to the newsletter. You can open a pull request on GitHub in the CircuitPython Weekly News repo, tag an engineer, or hashtag CircuitPython on Mastodon or X, or your uh, best bet, email cpnews at adafruit.com with the link. And uh, that wraps it up for the newsletter. Oh, no, it doesn't, because I need to uh, tell you how to subscribe. And you can subscribe by going to adafruitdaily.com you subscribe with your email address and it is used only for that purpose. You can unsubscribe whenever you want with no trickery, just uh, click a link. And uh, that is not tied to your Adafruit store account in any way as well. And that wraps it up for the newsletter. Next up is called the state of library, the state of CircuitPython, the libraries and Blinka. We use our Adabot to gather statistics from GitHub and a few other data sources. We try to cover seven 24-hour days of activity, ending sometime in the early AM hours of Monday today in the Eastern time zone. And so I'm going to tell you the overall, then do pass it around a little bit so that other folks can tell us about the sub parts of the project. So overall, we saw 12 pull requests merged. Overall, we saw 21 pull requests merged by 12 authors. Uh, some names that I don't recognize here, including Adelan Torre, Andy Bing, Sokro Matrix, and Wei Wing 83, and Landall. So thank you to those uh, new or less frequent contributors. We really appreciate you working to make CircuitPython uh, better. We try to review, we do review all of our pull requests, and this week I can thank five reviewers, Fomi Guy, Tanu, D. Halbert, Jepler, and Bill 88T. So thanks to all of those and especially to Bill 88T, who is not an Adafruit person, so just chipping in and helping make the world better. Another way that you can assist is by uh, through issues, and we saw 17 issues closed by three people and nine opened by eight people. And that wraps it up for the overall section, so I will pass it on to Dan to tell you about the core. Okie dokie, uh, God is off for a few weeks for a paternity leave but uh, the little baby yet. So uh, I'll, I'll be doing core for a little while. So um, in the core, in the last week, there were 14 pull requests merged by nine authors, and there were four reviewers, uh, very similar to the set that Jeff just read. And right now we have 21 open pull requests, which fits on one page, which is good. Um, in the past week, in CircuitPython, for CircuitPython 4, there were 10 issues closed by three people and five opened by five people. And right now we've got 744 open issues. They're divided into milestones uh, corresponding usually to versions or to long term, that kind of thing. So we have 10, uh, 13 open issues for the 10.00 version. Those are things that are deferred to do until we start working on 10.00. Um, there are zero open issues for 9.20. There are zero open issues for 9.2x post the 9.2.0 release, which we'll talk about in a bit. And there are 43 open issues that we hope to fit, fix sometime during 9xx, but some of those might be deferred to long term in the long run. Um, there are 22 library issues, 634 uh, long term issues, 16 issues that are uh, designated as support, which means that we're not really sure whether they represent a bug or not and 15 issues that depend on some third-party action, which so we can't proceed on them. And there are zero issues not assigned a milestone, so we don't have anything to triage right now. And that's it for the core. Thanks, Dan. Next, I will pass it over to Tim, Foamy Guy, to tell us about the libraries. All right, thank you, Jeff. Uh, this section covers all the CircuitPython libraries, um, all of which, uh, all the Adafruit libraries can be found on GitHub under names like Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, and then the name of whatever it is. Um, across all of those libraries this week, we had six pull requests merged by five different authors. Uh, thanks to Liz, Scott, Dan, Jeff, and uh, the new name that was uh, not familiar to me, uh, I think mentioned before, but just in case, uh, Wa Wang. 
83, uh, thanks to them, who might be a newer or less fre frequent contributor. Um, we had four reviewers to go along with those PRs, thanks to Dan, Jeff, Scott, and myself. Um, of the pull requests that were merged, we were uh, decidedly on the new side of things this week. The oldest one was only three days. The newest handful were just one day. Uh, that leaves us at the end of the week with 45 open pull requests. The oldest one is 802 days. Newest one is one day. Um, over the past week, we had seven issues closed by three people and four new issues opened up by three people, so net down a little bit on issues. Um, Hacktoberfest, we have assigned to all of the repos, so any PRs uh, that get merged during the month of October should count for Hacktoberfest based on that tag on the repos. Um, we have, uh, at the end of the week, uh, we have 886 open issues across all of these libraries, and there are 96 of those that are labeled as good first issues, uh, which you are able to find over at circuitpython.org slash contributing, which is the website where you should head if you are interested in getting involved in CircuitPython. Uh, on that page, again, circuitpython.org slash contributing, you'll find a list of the open PRs as well as the open issues. Uh, the first place where we tend to point folks who want to start getting involved is that list of open PRs. Take a look through the list of links, find something that interests you or that you've got the hardware for. Uh, click through to GitHub, take a look at what the PR is actually doing, um, review the code for syntax, uh, spelling, logic, um, anything within your capabilities, and uh, leave a comment there on Git GitHub letting us know that you looked it over and what you found. If you do have the hardware for it, then you can uh, also try running it on some hardware and let us know uh, that in your comment as well and how it went. If you do that a couple of times and you uh, like the process and want to get leveled up to leave official reviews over on GitHub, we can work with you to make that happen as well. Um, if you want to start getting your hands dirty with some code, you can also click over to the issues side of circuitpython.org slash contributing, which is a similar list of links, but these ones going to issues on GitHub rather than PRs. Uh, and so again, if uh, that's something that interests you, you can take a look through, find uh, an issue in a particular device that you have some interest in or that you've got the hardware for or some level of knowledge about, uh, and click through to GitHub, figure out what the issue is, whether it's a new feature or uh, in a, a uh, fixing a bug or what have you, adding a, an example, anything like that, and go ahead and uh, submit your own PR that implements whatever that um, issue is talking about. If you need help with that process, we have a guide for contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub. We also have uh, loads of folks who are, are around on the Discord who are more than willing to help you get spun up. So if you would like to contribute, whether it's reviewing PRs uh, or submitting your own PRs to solve issues, uh, or even just adding uh, examples or something that you think would be nice to add to the library, but you feel like you have a barrier uh, with the version control with Git or GitHub, uh, please come say hi to us on the Discord. We can point you to the guide, and we can uh, we can help you out there if you're still having trouble. Uh, we want everyone to be able to contribute, no matter what your background, uh, knowledge level, or uh, experience is. Um, I will tell you next about the library PyPI weekly download stats. Uh, we are back down slightly a little bit this week compared to last week. We're at 1.7 million uh, PyPI downloads, which is... Still up from our normal, but is looking like it might be somewhere around our new normal. Um, not entirely sure, sure still what change that caused that, but that's what we've had for the last couple of weeks is, is right in this range here. The top 10 list is here in the notes doc if you'd like to take a look through that. And uh, new and updated libraries this week, the INA3221, uh, the USB host MIDI, those are new added to the bundle this week. And then BLE and WizNet 5K were updated this week as well. That's what we've got for libraries. Thanks. Thank you, Tim. And now uh, Dan has volunteered to read the Blinka section today. So take it away, Dan. OK. Um, Blinka is our compatibility layer for CircuitPython and single board computers like Raspberry Pi. So it lets you run CircuitPython code in regular C Python on things like Raspberry Pis. Um, so in the past week, uh, there was one pull request merged by one author, and then there was one reviewer. That makes sense. There are five open pull requests, most of which are relatively elderly. Um, there were um, zero issues uh, closed by zero people, zero opened by zero people. Uh, there are right now 111 open issues for the Adafruit Blinka library. And in the past week, there were 68,000 PyPy downloads and about 
uh, 20, not quite 20,000 Pi Wheels downloads. And the number of boards that are supported under Blinka right now is 146. And that's it for Blinka. All right. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Tim. Uh, thank you, Adabot. Now we'll move on to Hug Reports. This is the first of our two round robin sections. Um, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the CircuitPython community and beyond for doing awesome things. I'll start, and we'll, then we'll go down the list alphabetically to give everyone a chance to participate. If you're text only or missing the meeting, I'll read your notes when I get to them in the list. So I'd like to start with a group hug and then a hug for the folks working on the audio effects module, a cool recent addition to CircuitPython that is now in CircuitPython 9.2. So congratulations on that and much more to be said about 9.2 in a little bit. Uh, but for now, I'll turn it over to Dan and then follow that up with Tim. All right, I'd like to thank everyone, absolutely everyone who helped to get uh, CircuitPython 9.2.0 to completion. Talk about that in status updates. Thanks to Foamy Guy for many improvements to circuitpython.org, kind of quality of life improvements. That's very nice. And thanks to John Dodge for uh, a button layout idea that is part of that, those improvements. Thanks to Bill AAT, who found a last minute um, RP2350 PS RAM issue and characterized it very simply. That was really helpful. And I fixed that for 920 final. And finally, uh, as Jeff mentioned, thanks to Gambler21, D. Cooper Dalrymple, and also Todd Bott, who I think was doing testing and contributing ideas to, um, and also Jeff, for the audio effects work that's going right on right now. There are two modules, audio delay, an audio something. <laughs> um, and thanks, thanks to those, those folks. OK. All right. Uh, it, next up, and apparently rounding out the section, is Tim. All right. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I have uh, actually first hug for you, uh, Jepler, for adding vector I.O. capability to the Unix port inside the core. I think that's really neat. Um, thanks to uh, Twitch user Ralph the Ninja one I don't know if they'll ever see this, but this person was watching along with my stream and helped me out with uh, some of the mistakes that I made while I was writing code and some of the content for the Learn Guide that I was working on. Uh, so that's always cool to have folks watching over your shoulder and uh, helping you fix stuff in real time. Um, thanks to uh, Echoing, I think uh, what Dan mentioned, thanks to Yano this week for sharing ideas on uh, different ways the installation instructions button could go in the circuitpython.org. Uh, which is one of the the things that I worked on this week uh, over there, which I'll expand upon a bit in status updates. And then I just have a group hug uh, for everybody in the in the community. Thanks. And in the text channel, uh, David Glowd says, Hug Report, thank you all for 9.2.0. And with that, I will move us on to the status updates section. Status updates is our time to tell folks what we're up to individually. I will start and we'll go through the list in the document order. So whenever I call on you, take a couple of minutes to talk about what you've been doing since the last meeting and what you'll be up to until the next meeting. It's also a opportunity to provide a quick tip or trick, but if it's anything more than a sentence or two, we will move it to the in the weeds section. And with that, I'll get started. Um, last week, I put some finishing touches to the TM1814 circuit Python module which is a module for controlling a different kind of addressable LED. And this includes setting the default current to the lowest value instead of the highest and supporting an inverted output mode, which will work with an upcoming Adafruit product that has a little inverter on it. Um, I've also been working on some stuff in Arduino related to floppies. And um, I am working on putting in a change to make the build stop with an error if the specified version of GCC is not present. And uh, Dan and I were discussing a little bit, there are some questions, where do we want to do the check? Do we want to do it uh, globally in CircuitPython or make it per port? We'll get that sorted out and then I'll put in a pull request. Um, and in the this is weird uh, department, I have a situation with an RP2350 feather that I had soldered PSRAM onto. And um, I noticed that I can't enter bootloader mode by holding boot and pressing reset. It does enter the bootloader if I hold boot and plug it in. And of course, this is not how it's supposed to work. Uh, after this meeting, I'm going to dig out a, a feather that doesn't have PSRAM installed and see if the same thing happens with the same firmware. 
And it's also uh, part of the behavior that if I use the reset button without holding the boot button, it works and resets back into CircuitPython. So something about this board, once CircuitPython has booted up, it's able to place the, the RP2350 microcontroller in a state where it can't reset into the bootloader. And that's, that's interesting. Um, but I don't know if anybody else has been affected by this. I didn't find anything in web searches. But anyway, enough about that. Um, I will pass it along to Dan. All right. Uh, so as um, mentioned, so I released nine Circuit Python nine point two point zero release candidate zero last later last week, and nothing. Uh, then there was a, a report, as I mentioned quickly, of an RP twenty three fifty problem, which I fixed, and then there were no other reports of some anything serious over the weekend. So I just went ahead and released nine two zero this morning because. Hardly anybody tries it until it's really the stable version. So I expect more bug reports after this. And now uh, I don't, there's nothing that's bothering me terribly about 920 right now in terms of unfixed bugs. Not that there aren't bugs, but uh, there, it's not, there aren't some, any that are so serious that I'm interested in right now. So I'm gonna be working on circuit matter while Scott is away, I'll be picking that up and learning it at the very least and hopefully uh, adding to it and uh, maybe debugging some aspects of it. And then when Scott comes back, you'll have seen some progress, I hope. All right, that's it. Thanks, Dan. And then last up again is Foamy Guy. All right, um, this past week, uh, I've submitted a fix for an issue in the display button library. This was something that someone actually reported in the help with channel on Discord. They were having trouble using this button with the grid layout, and it turned out to be a bug inside the button. So there's fix in for that. Um, I started working on a learn guide that details how to make custom animations for use with the uh, LED animation library. Um, I have thus far learned a lot about how it works, and I've implemented a handful of new animations to use as examples for various pages in that guide. Um, and I have a few more complex ones that I've been kind of dreaming up, um, possibly an implementation of Conway's Game of Life, and uh, maybe a few others that are uh, kind of interesting and push the limits of what the animation library can do. Um, I think it would be cool to show as kind of advanced examples. Um, the, uh, the other sort of main thing that I worked on this week was all circuitpython.org stuff. I've been going through the open issues and trying to tackle anything that looks uh, relatively quick and easy to do. And so the, the list of those that I've knocked out so far uh, is as follows. I fixed uh, an issue with the language choice for the pre-release version. So uh, we have 9.2.0 release now, like Dan just mentioned. So this is actually not a problem uh, on the absolute current uh, version of the site, but whenever we have a pre-release option available. There was a bug that was causing the uh, the user's choice for language to not apply to the pre-release download. It would apply to the regular one, um, but not the pre-release one. You would always get English. Um, so that's fixed. Um, there is. I added a new feature for castellated pads. This was uh, an issue that someone had submitted a while back requesting this feature. So the, the features list that allows you to filter the different devices has like a preset list of features that are allowed. Uh, this now uh, includes castellated pads, and I went through and found the 60 or so devices that have those um, based on their picture and added that to them, so they'll be able to filter up. Um, speaking of the filters on the downloads page, uh, the manufacturers list, uh, which you can filter by as well, has gotten super duper long. So one of the other issues was uh, an idea to shrink that down some visually and make it scroll inside of its own box so that... Uh, you don't have to scroll you know, super duper far down the page just to get to the actual list of downloads. Um, so that's in there now, and it's a nice like shorter um, scrollable list. So now the, uh, the features and uh, whatever else is in the middle, I forget. I think family is the other one. Now those are the longest uh, ones. Um, the, uh, let's see, where's that? Oh yeah, so speaking of the features as well, um, those features, you could always filter by them on circuitpython.org, but they were never actually... Uh, visible anywhere. So one of the other issues that I knocked out was making those visible on the downloads page. Um, some devices would put in the description uh, a list of features, but there's no sort of like, um, you know, specific way that they're listed. They're not all formatted the exact same across devices or anything. So this new feature will 
make it actually list out those filterable features in a, uh, a common way so that every device will look the same with these little tags that show what those features are. Uh, and then the last two were uh, added a how to install button. This is an optional thing that gets turned on if the device has a instruction link in its metadata. Uh, so for any device that doesn't have it, there won't be any change. But if the device does, then there will be a new button that gets shown on the download page that says how to install. And it links you to um, whatever that link from metadata is. And the, uh, the intention is to use that to go to a guide page or whatever that will tell you how to actually load CircuitPython on that device. Uh, and then, of course, like third parties could link to their own documentation if they, uh, if they, if they make that available for how to get it loaded. Uh, and then the last one, which was quick and easy, was um, just swapping the UF2 and the bin button. So for, for devices that have both available, uh, previously the bin button was on top. It appeared first on the page, and so I swapped that so that the UF2 button will appear first, uh, since it tends to be the easier of the two and the one that makes sense to point people towards first. Uh, and then last thing for me this week, I'll be on Deep Dive on, uh, on Friday afternoon. So come and hang out if you want to uh, see that. Thank you, Tim, but don't mute your mic yet because you are the first In the Weeds topic. In the Weeds is an opportunity for long-form discussions. And uh, so, yeah, take it away, Tim. All right, yep, this is um, still down the, the lane of circuitpython.org. One of the other open issues was about adding a check to ensure that the board ID, uh, which is one of the metadata values, to, to ensure that that matches the name of the markdown file. Um, at one point, there was one that was submitted with a typo where the name of the file didn't match. And so this was an idea to try to prevent that from happening in the future. Um, my questions and the reason I added it to in the weeds, because I thought it'd be uh, good for a quick discussion, is just like, A, do we want to do something like this right now or just hold off? Uh, if we do want to do it, um, how strictly would we want to enforce it? Uh, I found the code to actually check this is relatively straightforward. There's already a check on board IDs, and I was able to just add this as kind of an extra thing that it does uh, and run a report of what's currently um, in the system, so to speak. Um, so like, how strictly would we want it to enforce? Do we want it to fail the actions and not allow you to move on with your PR, or do we want it to just sprint, uh, spit out a warning or something like that? Um, and then if we do want it to be enforced, um, what do we want to do with the ones that are currently mismatched? So I, I did uh, run a quick report, and there are a handful, maybe a dozen or so, where the board ID doesn't match. Um, and they're not necessarily typos, they're just kind of like worded slightly differently. So um, if we do want to enforce it, what do we want to do about those? Do we want to try to rename them so that they will fit within the bounds of this new check? Uh, or do we want to make like an exceptions list or something so they will be able to just stay how they are now, uh, but not trip the uh, the failure? Um, and then my last question related to this was, would we? Uh, it, it, it's almost a separate thing, but it kind of got my got me thinking when I was working on this. Is would we want to check the board ID against um, the core repo? So um, right now, I don't think there's anything that ensures when a PR is submitted to slash uh, to the .org website that it actually exists in the core. But the uh, the issue is if it doesn't exist in the core, then the download buttons won't actually work. They'll just link to S3 into a page that doesn't exist. Um, so maybe that's a separate issue or a, a separate discussion or something, but it, it kind of came up in my head around the same time. So I looked at your uh, issue here. I mean, some of these are clearly typos. I'm not sure in in the list that you gave, um, there are maybe a few uh, core names that are should be fixed, like their dashes instead of underscores or something like that. And I haven't fixed those for exactly the reason that you're talking about, because I have to go change them on circuitpython.org and maybe change yeah. some links. So I haven't. I haven't fixed those, but it would be nice if they were all the same. I mean, certainly when a new board is added, its name is given in a in a list in the PR that updates circuitpython.org. And uh, so that those names are correct. If there are any other ones that are incorrect, it's because the name got changed out from under it or some, 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 other, some other reason, like it didn't, it wasn't added automatically when a release yeah. was done. Uh, 
I guess I would say two things. I mean, obviously, you'll need to take the aliases file into account. I think it should match what's in core. I think also maybe we need to provide redirects. Like maybe there needs to be a separate list of permanent redirects that you need to handle so that if people have links to these boards from somewhere else on the web, it would be nice if the link didn't break. Maybe that's not so hard to do. Um, that, does that make sense to you? Um, yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know um, how to implement it off the top of my head. I'll have to dig around a bit inside of d.org. But yeah, I agree. That was kind of my my fear with with changing any of them uh, was like if somebody has bookmarked it or, or whatever, if they have that link stored somewhere, then it will just suddenly be dead. So yeah, if there was some way to redirect them, um, I would totally be on board with that. Yeah, I would I'm, feel I'm way sure better about redirects available somehow. We just haven't needed to use it yeah. for anything right now. And it would be should be permanent redirect, yeah. Um, and I was going to say something. Oh, yeah. Another annoying thing is that the names in the bootloader names are not necessarily the same either. Uh, they're sometimes the same and sometimes not. And then finally, another thing that would enable all this, that, that would be enabled by all this, especially the redirects, is that right now in the core, there are some uh, names that don't have Ad, like Adafruit underscore or something. They don't have manufacturer as the first component. Yep. I think they're all maybe Adafruit boards, but it would really like Feather M0 is just Feather M0, not Adafruit underscore Feather underscore M0. Yeah. So if you implemented a redirect, then you would could feel free to change the names of the core and not worry about um, breaking circuitpython.org, which is another thing that I had worried about breaking when I was trying to change those names. Yeah. So there you go. That's those are, that's okay. my opinion. OK, the, yeah, I the will. thing okay. that, I, that occurred to me is if there's a thing that needs to match between the name of the file and the front matter of the markdown file, is there a way to refer to the name of the file instead so you don't need it? So we could just delete all those lines instead, and then we don't have to check if they match because they don't exist. There's not not the repetition. Mm. I don't know if that's feasible in the templating system, which I think is Jekyll. But if it is, yeah. then maybe we could just use that once they all match. Yeah. If they don't match, then you can't use the file name, right. I guess. You have to use the metadata. I would have to look into it. My instinct is I don't think the template... I, I think the template has access only to the metadata, which is kind of the stuff that's at the top of the YAML file. I mm -hmm. don't necessarily think it has access to the name of the file itself, but I definitely don't know for a fact. Um, so I will check into that. Yeah, because if that's possible, then that would be preferable, I think, in my mind at least, because that negates the need for a check and just makes it so that it will always match because it will just pull from from the thing that exists. So we would have to figure out what to do with the existing ones. Um, but if that is possible, I think I even lean in that direction more so than having both and making a check that makes sure they stay in sync. Uh, so I will look into that. Well, thanks, Tim. I see you're completing those notes in the document. That's very helpful. I will go ahead and move ahead to the wrap up stage of the meeting once I get back to my instructions. But uh, mostly, I just want to thank everybody for attending the CircuitPython weekly meeting uh, here on October 28th, 2024. And a reminder that to support Adafruit and CircuitPython, and those of us that work on CircuitPython, consider purchasing from the Adafruit shop at adafruit.com. Video of this meeting will be released on YouTube at youtube.com slash Adafruit. And then an audio-only version is released on major podcast services. There's also an RSS feed that you can add to your favorite RSS or podcatcher reader. Uh, it will also be featured in the Python for Microcontrollers newsletter. Visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe. And I believe the next meeting is at the usual time of uh, Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. The meeting is held on the Adafruit Discord. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. To get some notifications about the meeting or to speak in the meeting, 
you can ask to be added to the CircuitPythonistas role on Discord. It doesn't cost anything besides a couple, a handful of notifications per week on your Discord account. And with that, I just want to say we hope to see you all week, and thanks again to everybody.